very good evening, everyone. My name is Sunakshi, and I, along with my co-host Ruhail Amin, Senior Editor, Exchange for Media, welcome you all to day three for E4M Smart Tech India Bridge 2020. It's a week-long series of virtual events from 23rd to 26th June. And for those of you joining today, I'd like to tell you that it's a precursor to the main event, which is going to happen sometime, sometime in September. So the, basically the entire motive of this event is to build a network which is, robust, which is a big robust marketing community with MarTech as the main criteria. Today's sessions are based on what's next for mar in marketing technologies. Uh, our industry le leaders joining for the session include Adrian Swinsko, customer service and experience advisor, author, How to Wow, Tarun Katyal, CEO, Z5 India, Masid Zawazinski, founder, ClearCode, and CEO, Pickwick Pro, Navil Ahuja, co-founder and director, Exchange for Media, Adam Toporek, president, CX advisor, chief client hero, CTS Service Solutions, and Rahul Garg, CEO, Moglix. Now, before we proceed, I'd like to tell you if you have any questions, you can put them out on our Zoom chat, you can also use our hashtag Martech India on Twitter to post the same questions. We're also live on Facebook and our website. Uh, now we begin the first session of the day. I'd like to invite Adrian Squinsko, who's the keynote speaker. He will be talking about customer service and experience uh, customer service as an experienced uh, author and advisor based on his book, How to Wow. Adrian helps organizations of all size deliver customer experience and also helps in two, day, two ways. First is through being an advisor on specific services, experience, engagements, or he does that on a project to project basis. He also helps build internal teams and leadership capabilities via mentoring, thought leadership, including white papers, keynotes for internal customer and public events and masterclasses. He is also the best-selling author, Forbes contributor, blogger and podcaster and frequent conference speaker, panel uh, participant and chair. Welcome, Adrian. Over to you. Wow, that, what an intro. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure what to, not what to say after that. Thanks, so actually, that's, that's, that's amazing. Um, let me kind of like, well, let me just kind of get started. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and then we'll run through um, some kind of some quick slides um, that I hope that you will find kind of interesting. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that on full screen. What I will do is I'll stop my video just to, to start with and keep my mic on and then we'll just get, we'll get stuck into the, um, into the, um, into the talk. So, First of all, I just want to talk to you today about this idea of walking the CX kind of talk. As kind of as kind of Sonakshi kind of like said, is that you know my role is as an advisor, as a researcher, as a workshop leader. I'm an author. I write on Forbes. I've written three books, and I do a lot of conference kind of um, sort of speaking. But what I want to do today is just share with you some reflections on kind of what I've been seen, seeing, seeing kind of going on in the last um, few years and also the last kind of few months. Um, so first of all, let me kind of just kind of like, oh, I'm trying to move forward. There you go. Let me give you a bit of, a bit of context. And this is kind of prior to the whole, the, you know, the whole pandemic. You know, I think that what I saw actually before the pandemic and actually in the in the last kind of few years is we, we've seen a lot of talk about the important the importance of customer experience now don't get me wrong this is absolutely kind of great but a lot of it was talk and this talk is about walking the cx talk and actually going beyond it is actually it's it's about turning our words into action because actually if we turn around let me show you this slide with you which is i think kind of quite fascinating and it shows you the MarTech space. And it's actually, it's got bigger. It's called the MarTech 5000. I think now it's been up, this is from April, 2018, but now it's been expanded out to, I think it's now currently at the MarTech 7500. What that shows you is how complicated the picture is when it comes to experience and technology and the decisions that we have to make and the tools that are available uh, to us. But there's a lot of kind of like a lot of the talk is getting driven by, you know, by, by technology. And, but it, the reality is, is that there's lots of research that shows that somewhere north of 70% and, and above of all 
major transformation, whether that's digital or customer experience or, or whatever, mo many of these major pro uh, programs are, are failing to, be, um, to meet their objectives. And if this is not bad enough, actually, I think it was Forrester that at the beginning of the year, even before we had the, kind of the pandemic, we're actually claiming because of all of this, because of the lack of, um, of results that were getting delivered, they were saying that, that up to about 20, maybe 25% of all customer experience professionals were possibly in danger of losing their jobs um, at some point in 2020. I mean, so the, the thing I think that we, where we've got to is that we've got to this kind of point where the, the customer experience in and of itself is in danger of becoming like overly complicated technical benchmark framework measured codified etc cetera, etc cetera. and the you know the bottom line is that i actually think the industry and the 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 the, the domain the, the the function as it's become has become almost too obsessed with itself and it's lost um, sight of kind of who we're there to serve because it, you know the, the the data is clear is that most things aren't kind of like working there's too much choice, too many people, things are getting being led by kind of technology and people are in danger of losing their jobs. Now, if that wasn't as, that, that wasn't so bad, you know, then we can fast forward to now. And now we've actually just come through, or we are actually going through a pandemic, the likes of which we've never seen can before. And what's interesting about that is that multiple, multiple, multiple things are changing so fast, super fast, that it's, it's sometimes it's feeling hard to kind of keep up, you know, but if we actually step back and think about some of the things that we're seeing, I mean, I'm seeing these sort of things, panic, fear, anxiety, confusion, uncertainty. Now, maybe panic and fear were some of the things that we're seeing kind of early on, but I'm still seeing this residual anxiety and confusion and uncertainty that, that is pervading many of the things that, you know, um, the world around us, whether that's cut from a customer's perspective or from an employee's perspective or just generally at a societal level. So we have to be cognizant of that. We have to pay attention to some of those things that are the, the things that are going on around us and the mindset of people, because actually, particularly if you're in the experience industry, because actually research shows, and this is research that's coming out of places like kind of Edelman and, and, and other agencies, global agencies, and they're finding out that customers are, watching how brands and organizations are responding to this crisis. We also know that kind of behavior is changing, uh, particularly customer behavior, and a lot of stuff is moving online. Problem is, is we actually are not sure, we're trying to respond to that, but we're not sure as yet how much of it will stick as we can move back to some degree of normality. Um, but I actually think it's really interesting when we reflect on that is because I think the thing that we actually, that, that helps us kind of, or will help us frame um, our understanding of this is if we actually think about an old framework that comes from Maslow, it's called this hierarchy of needs. Now I think prior to the pandemic, many of us were focused and many brands were focused on some of the top, the higher echelons of this, of this hierarchy of needs you know, the top end of love and belonging and social needs, as well as self-esteem and self-actualization. And I, so that's, I think, where people were trying to aspire to. There was a lot of aspiration looking up the way. However, what's actually kind of happened, what the pandemic has done is gone, has basically swiped the top of the pyramid. And actually, right now, we are, many of, many of us are focused primarily on our you know, safety and security and physiological needs. You know, we, we, we feel like we've come under threat and we're kind of like, we're defaulting back to just like very, very basic sort of like stuff, safety and survival. And then as things are, are you know, are, are changing, I actually think that what we're seeing, we're starting to see an emergence into people wanting to reconnect with friends and family and loved ones and things, but that's only kind of gradual kind of as this kind of like fear and anxiety and confusion and uncertainty still kind of lingers. And I think that's one of the thing that, that, that organizations need to keep in mind. They need to keep in mind that in terms of where their customers are at, if they want to deliver a better experience with them. Because the real lesson for me is, as I've been observing all of this, is that we need to focus on making sure that we give our customers what they want, not what we think they need. And that's absolutely kind of key because, you know, other research has shown that, you know, 
customers are not the number of sales emails that are going out has gone through the gone through the roof but also that the actually engagement with the sales emails has actually kind of fallen through the floor however on the opposite side is that the number of marketing emails has gone up uh, through this kind of period but actually engagement with those kind of marketing emails has actually increased and it's increased conversion and you know and value you know at creation and so on and so forth the lesson, <coughs> the insight, I think, from there is that, that organizations need to, this is based on where their customers are, is they've got to understand that trying to sell right now is not helpful. Actually, being helpful is the most valuable thing that you can do. So don't sell, but help. Think about how you can build and focus on building the relationship and being helpful and valuable and, and of worth to your customers because that's the thing that's going to build you know, a platform for growth going forward. So even though that kind of companies are um, trying to kind of figure out a way how to get through all of this, sometimes we have to kind of go against our better, you know, our instincts and not think about trying to sell our way out of it. Maybe we need to think about how we, how we help our way out of it. So that, that for me is a little bit of context. So, but what I wanted to do was it, is next is just to run through quickly 12 things that I, think that companies that lead their fields on experience do very, very well. And I've, I've been augmenting these things over the last kind of few months based on what I think are emerging lessons that are coming out of the, the, you know, the pandemic. And the first thing I think is that, 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 that companies that lead their fields do really well is they understand the answer to this question, i.e. what is your experience strategy? I can't tell you how many times I've actually gone to different organizations and different, you know, spoke to different leaders and different executives. And I've asked them this question and they look at me slightly nonplussed and they're like, what do you mean? You know, customer experience is important to us. I'm like, oh yeah. And so what, what is your experience strategy? What is it you're trying to actually deliver and why? And they look, and then they kind of try and trot out, oh, it's omnichannel, seamless, digital, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, buzzword bingo type of stuff. And it's, it, it, strikes me that there's there's a lack of clarity here but they the the best in their fields to go further than this they go further with uh, their experience strategy because what they also do is they also figure out how does it support the achievement of their business objectives so they're completely tied together they understand what they're doing and what they want to achieve with their experience but they also understand how that kind of like um, helps the business achieve its own objectives, whether that's it helps them acquire more customers, whether it helps them um, generate better, you know, higher spend or increase loyalty or lowers its cost to serve and that results in kind of increased profitability. Those are the things that really matter. Those are the things that makes it, make, was gonna make kind of customer experience relevant to the overall business. Those are the things that are gonna deliver and turn that 70 plus percent uh, that I mentioned earlier um, into you know, into a winning number, you know, so those are things we've got to get, we've got to get right. That's one of the first things I think the leader's going to do. The second thing I think they, they do is that the leaders, that, the, the leaders that really stand out in their field is they really get to know their customers. And, and that what I don't mean by that is that I don't mean that they can collect lots of data and then make inferences about their customers is that they go past their data because they realize that customers are not just their data. You know, the customers, you know, if I ask you kind of like, does all, does your personal kind of data kind of like um, describe you completely as a human being, you turn around to me and tell me, no, not, uh, not at all. And I'd be like, you're absolutely right. So we need to go past the data to really get to know our customers, to really understand our customers, to really understand who they are and kind of the context in which they live in and what it is they want to try and achieve. And to do that, I think that what we're actually seeing right now, particularly through this pandemic, you know, this pandemic and as a result of the pandemic is that empathy is absolutely uh, key to this, to developing a better understanding of, of, of our customers. We need to try and build and become more empathetic. Now that's not just a, a, an organizational, an individual level. That's also an organizational level. And it's something I've been talking about is that this idea that we need to figure out a way of how do we build our empathetic musculature at an organizational kind of level. Now, that's not going to be easy. I and mean, you're not going to be able to buy something that necessarily helps you kind of with that because actually scientific studies show that kind of being 
empathetic and continuing to be empathetic is like building, it, it's hard. It's hard to do and uh, it's hard to do and it's hard to do continuously kind of well because our brains are not necessarily wired to always kind of like go that way. You know, it becomes a habit or a skill that we have to learn over time. So that is one of the key kind of challenges in terms of how do we really get to know our customers is how do we become more empathetic? How do we build that, as I say, empathetic musculature to help us kind of reduce the gap between us and our customers so we really kind of build kind of better relationships with them. The third thing that I wanted to highlight is that it's linked to the first one is that the best companies, they, they start with the end in mind. They understand that actually we, we have to articulate what our experience is and then we think about what is the data we require and what is the technology that we, um, that, that we need to deliver that experience and it has to be done in that order. Because what I'm seeing is many people in the, in, in the industry, they, are, they start buying tech in order to kind of deliver a better experience. And I think that's the wrong way around because actually they're not clear, as in I said in the first point, they're not clear on kind of what is the, the experience strategy and what they want to deliver. Um, and therefore it feels all kind of slightly connected and a slightly Frankenstein sort of, um, you get a slightly Frankenstein sort of experience because they've bought all these kind of like pieces of technology to solve all these kind of problems, but they still don't have a clear idea of kind of what they want to do and why. So it's start with the end in mind, start with the experience and then work backwards from there. And if you do that, you're not going to go far wrong. The next thing is where we get down to some of the nitty gritty, because it's not all about um, kind of doing, you know, sexy and new things. Actually, it's about a lot of the time, if you, it's about doing the basics brilliantly and doing them kind of like well and doing them consistently well. This is sometimes not very sexy work. It takes discipline and focus and commitment and time and things, but it's figuring out kind of do the, understand what the basics are for their customers. If that means that they want to get hold of, of you kind of quickly and they want answers to the questions before they can really show up or they want to be able to kind of easy, kind of find kind of uh, easy answers to the questions on your, on your website, those are the things that we need to get good at. Now we've seen people make some massive strides in this over the last kind of few months. You know, a friend of mine kind of, uh, sent me a message and it was talking about this idea of I can't, believe how much punk CX I've seen going on in the last kind of like few months. The idea that things that would normally take months, if not years, are happening in days and weeks rather than actually kind of, um, you know, the, the longer period of time. So focus on, figure out what the, um, the basics are for your customers and make sure you, you, that you're brilliant in them. And that includes how you communicate with them. Because here's the thing that is, is emerging in the pandemic is that, you know, communication has been absolutely key, particularly when we think about the, you know, the levels of anxiety and confusion and uncertainty where, which is in the minds of our customers is we have to keep them informed. And so we have to communicate, communicate, communicate. We have to do it, do it a lot. Do it more than you think you need to. And make sure it's open and honest. And don't make assumptions that people will always have, always have seen kind of what you've kind of done or what you've said or you've kind of, you know, what you've written about. You know, you know so eliminate those, the, the likelihood that people will have missed it by keeping communication. It's not about just doing it once, it's about making sure that people kind of understand where you're at all of the time. Um, the next thing they do is they are relentless in their pursuit of, of removing little irritations in their, their customer's experience. There, this is a picture I love about a, a lady that is wrestling in to try and get one of the uh, wrestling pump, you know, plastic packaging trying to get into um, the, the, the energy saving kind of light bulb that she's just bought. If anybody's kind of like, I've had that experience myself, that's why I love this kind of picture. And the only thing that I remember about buying the, the, one of those light bulbs is the wrestle that I, uh, that I had with the packaging. For me, that's grit. That's like, that's not supposed to be the point. The point of the light bulb is to get it and put it in and make it make sure it works and it's reliable. It's like, I shouldn't be remembering you know, the, the wrestle I have with, uh, with the packaging. So make sure that you build a culture that is always looking for the little improvements, because here's the thing, solving and removing lots of little irritation or irritations or bits of grit from your customer's experience. If you do that and you do that continuously and consistently, lots of little things are going to add up to big impact, but also realize that there is no kind of end to this. You know, like um, people talk about transformation and I think transformation is such a useless word 
because if we're not transforming anything, if anything, we're just evolving, we're adapting, we're changing fast. So I, I like to bring in a kind of a, a, a quote from a, um, an old, a, like a punk song that I love from a band called Bad Religion. And it's their, their song is called No Control. And there's a quote in there that says, there is no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. Now that's an original quote from a book from the 1780s. It was written by a gentleman called uh, James Hutton that wrote the first book, the first recognized book, I think, on, 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 on geology. And what he can realize is that like, like in matters of the earth, it's, we're never finished. And, and therefore we have to keep going. We have to understand that things will always be changing. I think we need to kind of realize that um, in our own businesses as well, because you know, it will be the most adaptable and the ones that are the, the, the ones that are the most adaptable, the most flexible, and the most tuned into their customers, those will be the ones that survive. So it's not about transformation, it's about adaptation. It's about, you know, it's about being flexible and and and, and responsive and being willing to kind of you know to change fast and to you know to try things. On top of that, we also need to kind of know we need to try and strive for simplicity. Because simplicity pays, you know, there's, a, there's a, an ongoing piece of uh, research that I would encourage you to check out. It's done by a company called Siegel & Gale, based out of New York. They have this thing called the Simplicity Index, and they have actually an index in there for, for India as well, and a whole bunch of brands in India that show that um, since 2009, a stock portfolio comprised, comprised of the publicly traded simplest brands in their global top 10 has outperformed the major stock market indices by check this out ladies and gentlemen 679 percent that's that's, that's mind-blowing numbers but that's simplicity both on the outside and also on the inside because consumers like simpler a simpler experience and they're put more they're willing to more uh, to pay more for a simpler experience they're you know also employees kind of you know prefer a simpler experiences as, as well by the way for for those um um do check out the, um, the, 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 the Indian top 10. Um, I'll give you a quick rundown. It's like number one is Google, number two is Amazon, number three is Maruti Suzuki, number four is Nokia, number five is Sony, number six is HP, number seven is Make My Trip, number eight is Philips, number nine is Dell, and number 10 is TVS Motor. That's, but that's not the company's kind of view, that's their consumer's kind of view. Now building on that, I mentioned the internal side of things. The next one I think is that we need to also make sure that if we're making it things simpler for, for our um, for our customers, we also got to make it kind of. We've also got to make it simpler for, you know, our employees. But not just our employees, our direct employees, but also all those kind of people, in, whether it's freelancers or agencies or con contractors that help us and that are essential to delivering that great experience. You know, it's not good enough for us to think that oh, we just need to focus on the customers. Actually, the employee experience matters just just as much. And so we need to get that right. The next thing I wanted to come, come on to is, I want to come on to this idea is that loyalty is absolutely key and to, to the success of any, kind of like any business and the longevity of any business. And right now, with the, kind of what we're seeing with the, the effects of this pandemic is loyalty is going to matter more now than ever. But ladies and gentlemen, Let's be clear, loyalty is not about a program. Research shows that 90% of all loyalty is earned at or around the point of purchase or when something goes wrong. If I split that up, it's about between 45 and 50% of it happens around um, the point of purchase. I, how do customers feel about that? And that, if you think psychologically, what that means is like, make me feel good about my purchase. Make it easy for me. Make me feel like I've got, uh, I'm making the right decision. So that, that takes care of all of that. Now, we also know as human beings that things go wrong. And what, how you respond when things go wrong is absolutely essential. Now, if you think about it from a, from a human psychology perspective, we don't like risk and uncertainty and the, 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 the possibility of failure. So if somebody shows up and helps us solve those or takes those problems away or saves us in inverted commas we value them kind of very very kind of like uh, very very highly so those two things both the buy the, the around the buying experience the point of purchase and also what we do when kind of things go wrong explains 90 percent of of the, of the loyalty of our of, of our customers 
Now linked to that is the best companies, they, they understand that this can't all necessarily be done by the human touch or by just by technology. And what they do is they understand, as I've been saying all along, they understand the makeup of their customers. They understand what the customers can like kind of want. So, they, so they're able to strike the right balance of technology and the human touch. So people get the connection and the service and the experience that they want and the, um, and the desire at the right kind of point in their, you know, their journey. The next thing is that we've been talking about this for such a long time, you know, that traditional customer service is normally kind of reactive, i.e. You know, when something goes wrong, then we respond. But that's no longer good enough. We've got the data and the analytics and the technology and hopefully the will to allow us to be more proactive you know, in, by nature. Actually, we've got, we should have also the experience to understand kind of what problems normally show up kind of um, over, over time for customers. And so we, we, need to, um, we need to respond, we need to be proactive by nature. We need to solve problems for customers when they, um, before they show up or as they show up. So they don't need to come to us to come looking for the solutions. And research supports that if they do that, that it, it drives, you know, um, greater perception of experience, greater loyalty, greater satisfaction, increased spend, all of, those, all of those good things. But not enough organizations are doing this as a matter of course. But the best that do do it and get it right are the ones that stand out. Another couple of, kind of things I want to share with you. The, the, the eleventh thing that people, um, the leaders I see kind of do is they realize we, there's a big talk around personalization. I mean, to be, create kind of more a personalized experience. The problem is that tends to get kind of dominated by marketing. That it, they, but I actually think we need to personalize everything, everything about our experience. And it's not just about marketing. We need to kind of think about personalize it in terms of how do we, how do we implement uh, intelligent routing? How do we implement the recommendations of our next best actions. How do we implement kind of like proactive kind of like service that's tailored to somebody's experience? How do we implement, you know, personalized kind of recommendations? How do we implement personalized kind of customer success, success based on kind of what a particular account can, you know, uh, needs? So we have to, it's not just about marketing. We have to personalize kind of everything. And I think the best, the real kind of like the, the real leaders, uh, these are the things that they're striving for. And then the last thing that I wanted to share, and this is something that has emerged out of the pandemic, given, particularly given that many kind of brands and organizations have had to uh, move to re a remote or distributed kind of way of working wherever possible. And I think what's actually kind of like emerged from that is that we are, it's requiring us to, to really consider how we can lead and manage and supervise kind of teams and organizations. It's requiring a different type of kind of leadership, you know, and I think here's a quote that has come from, um, from a colleague of mine, a contact of mine, a guy called Nate Brown, which I think absolutely nails it in terms of what is required. He says the days of butts in seats, excuse my language, as both a physical reality and a management style are over. So successful contact center leaders will be those with the capability to engage a remote workforce, creating both an exceptional agent and customer experience with a decentralized team. Now, I think it captures the nature of it because it's, we, and it's a challenge for leaders is how can I get the best out of my kind of people if they happen to be working kind of remotely? Because I think there is, there is a, a real likelihood that a lot of remote working is going to be here to stay. And we're never going to go back to, um, completely back to normal and in inverted commas, but we'll probably end up kind of implementing like a more of a hybrid approach to um, how we work, where there will be some remote working and some on site, and those two populations may kind of overlap and intermingle kind of over, over time. I just think that the dynamics has changed over, uh, over um, the last few months, and we've seen kind of what is, what is possible for, for organizations. And that is asking some serious questions around the sort of leadership and management that is required to sustain that type of kind of work um, um, kind of system. So in sum, here's a, I know this is a busy slide, but this is a list of all 12 of the things I was talking, uh, talking about just in summary. 
I hope those things have given you some some pointers, some um, some you know some insights. I hope they've also been a bit challenging as well because this is where it's all about. We've got sometimes we have to be open to learn the lessons or to see what the, you know what things need to kind of be done or where we're falling short. So if these twelve things are like a checklist. Then maybe that's the thing that you do is you you score yourself against those you know those twelve things. See and ask yourself truly and honestly and openly how are we doing and could we do better so that's it just want to say thank you to, uh, to, to you all my name is adrian spinsco these are my details you know if you've got any questions about all of that sort of stuff then kind of let me know i am more than happy to um to answer any questions you have and that thank is you. ladies and gentlemen the end thank you adrian uh, wonderful points made uh, you, you summed up well in those 12 points uh, that we still have two minutes so i'll take uh, two quick questions uh, one is uh, uh, one question is uh, many times customers want something which they are not sure if they need it. Should their need be not understood before they are given what they want? Um, so I guess my, my, my question would be uh, um, to that uh, I, is to first of all can, to first of all ask if you're uncertain then you should go back and ask for clarity and get the customer to kind of like to, you know, to, to, um, to explain um, kind of what they need and why they, you know, why they need it. It's a difficult kind of, it's a very general kind of question, but I think that there are, are um, I think our, our instinct is not just, it shouldn't just be to, um, if we think the customers are, the customer is possibly wrong or mistaken or, it may not be then, like I said before, is we've got to really get to know our customers and that requires us to maybe step into it and go, right. please help me understand why you think you need this. Please tell me kind of like, and why you're going to, because doing that, that might not feel comfortable, right. but that's the way that we're going to get to know our customers kind of better. We have to be willing to step into these conversations and take the time to do it. Perfect. Thanks. I think we don't have much time left. The other panelists are here. And thank you very much for joining us. And I would like to hand it over to Mr. Nawal Ahuja, co-founder and director of Exchange for Media. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. And thank you, Rohil, for uh, moderating the session. Uh, very insightful. I hope uh, uh, we still have your attention. And uh, I'm now going to take up the next session with uh, two leading experts in the OTT and MarTech domain. Let me introduce, uh, introduce uh, the panelists I have today. Uh, I have with me uh, Tarun Katyal, whom uh, I'm sure a lot of you in the Indian media advertising ecosystem know. He's a media veteran of, of over two decades. Tarun Katyal is the CEO of C5. In his current role, Tarun is responsible, as you know, for steering, C5, steering Z5, India's largest and most comprehensive digital entertainment platform for language content towards gaining industry leadership position. As you also know, uh, Tarun has a varied and diverse background across India's leading media companies. He was last at uh, Big FM, where he was the founder, CEO, and CEO during his duration. He also set up Twink Big, the content incubator, and the big TV channels, Magic and Ganga. Tarun began, began his career with advertising agencies, but now, as you see, he's, he's a content advertising tech expert. He also worked with the Star Network, where he rose to uh, head the content and communications across the network in India. Uh, he also was instrumental in uh, uh, the record of accomplishment through successful shows like KBC. Uh, apart from that, he was, you know, he was famous for launching Indian okay, Fear Factors and a lot of other shows in India. Welcome, Tarun, on board. Uh, glad you're here doing this with us. And as I mentioned, uh, Tarun is now. Uh, uh, part of Z5, which is India's leading uh, OTT network. Uh, I was just uh, going through some of the sub stuff uh, Z5 has been doing. And from what I understand in the last uh, three, four months, their uh, consumption has uh, shot up by almost 80% 80, 80 uh, uh, during the lockdown period. They made aggressive investments in Z5 ads, ad tech. Uh, they also have a partnership with Airtel and Geo Fiber. And they are also launching very soon Hyper Shorts, which is uh, India's first ever fully homegrown short video platform. So all the best to you on that, Tarun. Uh, in addition to Tarun, uh, what we also thought was to invite a leading uh, MarTech expert from uh, 
uh, from Europe. Uh, Mache Zawadinsky is with us. Uh, uh, hi, Mache. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, Mache is an expert Thanks for having in me. and advertising technology and a founder of several, several successful companies. Uh, Mache is also currently devoting his knowledge and skills to developing uh, Pivik Pro, a privacy-focused analytics platform and the perfect alternate, as they say, to uh, Google Analytics. He's also in the past led clear code uh, to its position as a world-leading software house specializing, specializing in customer, customer advertising and marketing technology. Thank you for joining us, Mache, all the way from Poland. Uh, so thank you, gentlemen, for being part of this session. Uh, we have uh, people uh, tuned in already. Uh, and as, uh, as has been announced already, uh, the, the topic of what uh, we are discussing today is around the collapsing web banner and third party data while uh, shifting ad budgets to OTT. Before I get into you know, the uh, detailed uh, thought points about uh, what's going to happen, let me ask you uh, a very elementary question. We've uh, seen over the last many years, uh, Google, Facebook have had a you know kind of duopoly when it comes to customer uh, attention as well as advertising money. Why don't you tell our, uh, both of you tell our viewers, what are the three big reasons? Why do you think over the next 12, 18 months, this money, the advertising money, as well as consumer attention is likely to shift from that duopoly to also uh, the third pillar, which is gaining currency very fast in India and outside India, which is the OTT ecosystem. Tarun, why don't we start with you? So thank you, Naval, for a long introduction. Uh, I was almost embarrassed at the end of it. Um, thank you, uh, Maciej, for joining us from Poland. Uh, it's really good to have you around, and, and I hope it isn't uh, too early in the morning for you. Uh, so it's a good question, right? Where is digital advertising going? Uh, what is going to happen to independent publishers? What's going to happen to the big, large networks of Facebook and Google? For anybody to say that Facebook and Google are going to go away would be quite kind of very foolish, right? Uh, will they reduce their influence on, on digital advertising? Uh, maybe. Will other publishers come in uh, and come in with scale? I think definitely yes. And why is that? Uh, I think for many years, the capability of segmented and targeted advertising, uh, the capability, capability of doing uh, good big data, having great ad servers, digital ad servers, being able to do uh, a great consumer profiling 360 through a good CDP, lied or was only a domain of the big tech, right? Which was Google and Facebook and and a little bit of Amazon when they started their advertising program about a couple of years ago. But I think the democratization of technology uh, and the democratization of, of platforms and their ability to attract users and users at scale is allowing for this paradigm to change, for this picture to shift. Um, platforms like ours and, and even others like Hotstar or many others are now over, you know, closing to 100 million or over 100 million users uh, with some significant amount of video consumption around some very quality content with a high amount of loyalty. And I think the picture started to change about two to three years ago when uh, most broadcasters in India and across the world realized that they couldn't let the OTT game be secondary and be played uh, by either syndicating content to platforms right. like uh, Netflix or, or Amazon or, or putting their content on a revenue share on platforms like YouTube. But they had to control their own digital destinies. They started building their own platforms. But once they built their platforms and they started to see some very scaled up consumption, they realized that they hadn't invested enough behind analytics and ad tech. And I think the last... Uh, 12 and the next 12 to 18 months, we'll see some significant investments and building up of independent networks on the base, on the back of, you know, partners like ClearCode and others in, in actually getting what they deserve and owning the end-to-end -end ad tech pipeline for themselves. Right. Ache, you uh, work very, uh, you know, deeply in this entire audience measurement or rather the audience journey measurement and the you know martech space what is your sense globally also a lot of media traditional uh, legacy media companies are investing a lot in the ott space 
Disney just you know uh, pulled out all their content from Netflix and has launched their own uh, platform. What's your sense of what the future looks like? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. I mean, uh, I think uh, I I totally agree with what Tyron said. Uh, I want to add one point before I, I answer this question: is that the very big advantage of OTT is creating these brand experiences. Like there is no ad blog, banner blindness, and they like you know ways that uh, will be distracted from uh, from seeing the the brand message. Um, so this is a big advantage. Where I see disadvantage and where what why there is so much investment into this space is that um, uh, the Advertising on web or in mobile apps has been with us for decades uh, now, and uh, maybe for mobile apps, not decades, but for web, definitely decades. And the technology is very advanced today. Uh, There is a lot of attribution platform, segmentation, and so on. We'll come to that probably uh, why some of these platforms will no longer work with the demise of cookies, but they are very advanced compared to what's in OTT. And there is a big investment into the, this creating these ecosystems where there is end-to-end uh, ad buying, uh, data uh, analytics, attribution uh, for the OTT channel, uh, because basically we are building in a, in a matter of the last few years, everything that has been created uh, on the web for over a decade. So I see uh, there is a big need uh, because there is a big, uh, ad- uh, big uh, opportunity and uh, great inventory, great, great, great experience. But uh, we need to catch up with the technology uh, and some of the players like Z5 is already, all, are already doing or in the process of doing that. Uh, but there's a lot of legacy players even in the US that are uh, years behind. Uh, and they are starting to, to build this technology for the OTT. So, uh, good you uh, brought up this point about, you know, third-party cookies, extin- extinction of the third-party cookies. So, what happens? You know, how do you see the future of uh, audience buying and advertising on digital changing? And how does the OTT system uh, gain out of that? Give us some granularity. You know, what do you think will happen, say, in the next 12 months? How, how does the balance of power kind of shift? Mm-hmm. So, also, given the fact that privacy laws are becoming very strict. Overall. Yeah, that, that, that's what, one point. So I think there are two uh, things that influence that. One is the regulatory space, and not only what happened in Europe with GDPR, but also what's uh, happening in Brazil, what's happening in India, in other countries where the privacy laws get stricter. And there is a, a limitation in what we can do in context of yeah. sharing the data between vendors. That's why you... I see that there will be a big reliance on first party data. And some of the big publishers on web, like even New York Times announced that they will like no longer do the third party audience uh, uh, selling or buy or or inventory selling. It will be all based on the first party data. Um, And uh, the OTT has a big advantage uh, as by design we know everything, like we, we, the users are identified. They log in with their like username or their telecom into the OTT platform. So they are identified. It's not like with web where we can lose the cookie when the user uh, blocks it or, or changes the browser. So uh, I think there, this is like by design, a huge advantage of OTT that we'll, we are dealing with primarily identified audiences. And that's what all other channels are going, uh, shifting to, uh, uh, primarily on web where the cookies are used and, uh, and they will no longer be uh, relevant. What I see also is that uh, there is more interest in the first party data uh, technology. So CDPs in particular, yeah. uh, building the cust- customer data platforms to uh, aggregate data across different sources that these organizations have. And I think, again, OTT has a big advantage that they can do great partnerships uh, with uh, various players, whether there are telecoms or whether there are other like internet providers or there are, um, there are other partners that have data and having identified audience helps you to match this data with the partner 
and and reach your uh, and and reach your audience uh, data, and that that is uh, a matter of like selling the uh, ad inventory at a high premium price versus selling it uh, unidentified users at a low price. Right. So let me st uh, stay on this point about data and hop hop across to Tarun. Uh, Tarun, uh, these are interrelated things. You know, if you look at the large uh, uh, publishers, uh, non OTT publishers, the Googles and the Facebook books of the world, they inherently require registration, and hence they are able to you know mine that data because they know who exactly is using a Gmail and who's using the Facebook account. They managed to build huge you know programmatic plays on top of this layer of data that. They are primarily collecting directly from the users. OTT players, on the other hand, uh, have a mixed bag. So, in cases where you have subscriber data, obviously people are paying, and you know they are they are kind of holding accounts. But there's a large number of users who are who are consuming OTT content without really you know registering and giving you access to that kind of data. So, how do you think OTT players over the next say 12 months can overcome this uh, you know primary data deficit that currently uh, they have? Because that also kind of le means more more earnings. The more the advertiser can map uh, the data, the primary data, the more uh, his confidence in uh, investing in the platform goes up. So <clears throat> you're right, uh, Naval. I think uh, OTT made a mistake when they launched that they allowed a lot more guest users onto their platform without registering, uh, you know, directly with the OTT platform. So I'll tell you two or three things that OTT platforms did or shouldn't have done. One. We all allowed guest users to keep consuming video because we thought it was early stage uh, without having compulsory or mandatory registration. Uh, two, while doing the mandatory registration, we didn't take enough fields like age and gender and so on and so forth. Third, we allowed a lot more social logins on our platform, which uh, didn't give us enough data uh, pipeline from the social platforms like Google and Facebook. And all of this is something that we corrected over a period of time. I think you live to learn and learn to live. Um, so to, to help you understand a platform like ours now, if you watch uh, over five videos without being registered, uh, you have to go back and register. So it's mandatory registration uh, at one level. At the second level, uh, even if you were to come in and register through social, which is uh, because of convenience we still allow, which is Facebook and Google, we, you have to enrich your profile in terms of age and gender. And, and it's even more important for us because Increasingly, uh, government laws and regulation around uh, content and around age and guard, guardrails around that make it very important for us to get that data, both date of birth as well as gender for us. Uh, then lastly, I think uh, we've also all built a network of relationships uh, on data partnerships to be able to enrich this first party data with other partners, partners who have similar logins. And we work with other loyalty programs, we other work with other telcos uh, who are able to actually bring alive our data management platforms. And much like uh, Machez was saying, we now have a fairly big investment in building a consumer data platform, which where not only our first party data and registered verified users flow in, but a lot more uh, data partners who flow in their data uh, basis are their understanding and their consumption of the same users. And we've been able to multiply that, that those attributes and that profile in a fairly rich manner. Uh, and that investment continues to grow and grow. So much, uh, as you know, India is a unique country. Uh, uh, to convert users into subscribers is far more tougher as compared to some other parts of the world. And hence, as Tarun said, a lot of the OTT usage started as a sampling service to you know, lower users in and keep the barrier of entry as low as possible, not even ask them for basic details. So what do you think, like Tarun was explaining, what do you think are the ways that, you know, uh, now that there is a substantial chunk of user base and advertisers are looking at the platforms very seriously to invest in, what are the ways in which you can, we can sort of short circuit the process and jump over because you can't have now suddenly millions of people, you know, registering and sharing their data overnight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I think like uh, what Tarun mentioned about gated content and uh, forcing the users after they experience the the service to sign in is the the way that like it's a global trend even for non OTT content um, and uh, 
that's that's basically you know how you gain the identified users the moment you have identified users you can do much more in context of the data and what's most important you can collect bits of data over time and you don't lose it uh, in the cookie world like the moment that the browser clears the cookies you are losing all the history and here like the moment we, we don't have to collect all the data at once we can do it very slowly we can also build it based on the content consumption uh, over time how it changes we can do a lot of analytics based on that that will help us later to uh, classify the users into audiences that will be uh, very valuable for the advertisers. I was, and uh, you know, uh, sorry, Naval, can I come in? And I think the big advantage that OTT players bring in uh, into the country is that advertisers are used to buying on some of their key market shows on uh, broadcast, right? But advertisers didn't know what the psychographics and what the other attributes of these users were. The same users uh, and a fair amount of them migrate from watching on TV to watching on OTT. You now know them one at an N equal to one level. That's right. And two, uh, you now know them far more than what you knew before, which you knew them through a panel and you knew them through a panel into age and gender and so on and so forth. But as more data flows in and as you grow to know them more and more, your ability to get those many signals into the same set of users that you were doing through broadcast now on OTT is far richer. Uh, a platform like ours, which is becoming 360 degree in terms of being a super app, we now have <clears throat> Hypershots coming and Hypershots becomes almost quasi-social, right? Where, uh, where you have far more many signals uh, because there's user-generated content and people like and share and, and display affinity to a certain kind of users or a certain kind of stories or certain kind of, uh, you know, even products. And all of those signals keep enriching your first party data, which is all uh, verified uh, through a single identifier. So tell me, that's very interesting, the hyperlocals point. Tell me something. Why don't you tell us a little more bit about it, especially how do you plan to dovetail user generated content into the existing content on the platform? How will it work, the synchronization? So it, it doesn't uh, really synchronize in that sense. It's a separate uh, section within the app. So it's much like a super app where you have right. different uh, uh, yeah, different areas. Uh, but what we thought was really that, you know, for several years, uh, the influencer game built the social uh, uh, platforms, right? And who were these influencers? These influencers were, were all these TV stars who, who, who are really on our shows for so many years, right? So all the 40 channels of the Z network and all the characters and actors within that actually build the entire influencer list in the country. A, a part of it, not all of it. And then there is Bollywood and there is sports and, and there are newscasters. And we thought that we had, we had access to so many of these. Their fans wanted to connect with them directly. And uh, the fans anyway came to consume their characters on our platform on a daily basis. Yeah. And we could extend that experience of fandom onto uh, a Hypershots platform. Also, uh, you know, all our reality shows allowed regular users to become superstars or, uh, you know, at least celebrities of their own. And this Hypershot platform will also funnel that talent into our, you know, our various reality shows and so on and so forth. So really, there were three uh, vectors that we were working on. One was fandom. One was fun. And we thought that there's a lot out there that you can play and play with music, play with dialogues and all that. And the last was factual. And we think that there is a lot of DIY content uh, in short form that is waiting to be done. And, right. and all of it had a great overlap with our existing audiences. And we thought that, you know, while audiences in India find it difficult to have too many apps on their phone, largely because of low memory, low real estate in, on the phones, one super app could do it all for them. Fantastic. Uh, let me just pick up an audience question now. Uh, uh, there's somebody who uh, wants to know, would OTT overtake television or cinema in the next five years? I think that answer, that question has been answered in many research reports. But I'm not right. going to... Uh, <laughs> but I'm not uh, going to put my you, job you up. To <laughs> company, which is 
primarily a television company which has been so far a television company and the, <laughs> it is an anonymous attendee let me also tell you i can't see the name on the screen it's an anonymous attendee <laughs> why don't you tell us what is pitch pitch madison report saying well i mean my sense is that uh, uh, in india you know like it's happened with mobile telephony it's happened uh, so many times in media things move on parallel tracks so it's not like one thing takes over the other ott will grow at at its own pace television penetration is still growing you know uh, a lot of companies have been very fast to uh, pronounce the death of print but look at regional print you know it continues to grow at a healthy rate year after year so i think a lot of learning that we have from western markets might not be exactly replicable in india at least for the next 5 years television will continue to grow obviously the pace of growth uh, will be different because ott's base is low i was reading another report which said uh, over the next 5 years ott ecosystem is expected to grow 24% uh, compound annual uh, rate of growth which is significant given the fact that the ad- advertising market in the last 4 5 years has, has grown at what a cagr of 11 12% give or take so ott yeah, grow it. at 2x and obviously Uh, one of the components that will fuel the growth is also subscription monies uh, which for television has also started coming in if you see in the last 5 6 years which was a very small pie you know before digitization in television started so the simple answer is i don't think anybody can really predict whether it will overtake cinema or television but one thing is for sure ott will become a very very large pie of the entire digital ecosystem which will be large enough maybe it will be equal to tv in 5 years that is certainly a possibility this year from what i understand digital itself would have reached 17 18000 crores in india which is from some 1.5 billion dollars but maybe because of covid the growth will be lesser but in 5 years yeah but, but one bigger. of the segments that will grow even this year they say uh, even after all of this possibly digital and digital video will possibly grow the fastest yeah that's right so let me come back to you uh, so you answered this much better than me oh you <laughs> <laughs> i've learned from you tarun <laughs> <laughs> let me hop back across to uh, uh, to mache you know one of the things uh, uh, that we keep talking about uh, mache is uh, data you know privacy of data i think that's globally uh, a massive issue <laughs> in countries like india how the data is going to be used i was reading uh, today actually that uh, i think it's germany that has uh, disallowed facebook a german supreme court has disallowed facebook to mine user data for selling to third parties right and so yeah why don't you tell us a little more uh, you you have better idea about what's going on there sure so i mean uh, i think with facebook is very interesting uh, case because um they collect the user data interactions etc so they have locations almost everything that we do there there is a lot of Spending significant amount of time there, so um, the Supreme Court ba- banned them from uh, selling to third parties. But what they say, they don't sell the data because they sell advertising targeted by the data, and the data does not leave the ecosystem. Um, so there is still, like, I think, uh, some uh, dispute over, like, uh, whether they are using it, like. in my opinion they are using it for advertising not for the purpose of like serving the user the content and using the service so they are using it for advertising purposes and the user has to agree to that but in their opinion they are not sending it they are selling advertising right. and they are not exporting the data outside of their their ecosystem um talking a bit more broadly about privacy yes it gets much stricter and i think like the this is the good thing like the ad tech and marketing technology space just got out of control and we like the the whole industry earns that that they are now forced to adapt and there will be a lot of changes uh regarding regarding that but it's not that you know uh we won't be able to to track the users we have to do it with the uh certain uh either consent or certain anonymization uh so that we cannot target an indiv- individual rather than audience uh but uh but it's not that it's end of the world for ad tech companies now like we see like even uh clearco the company i found that sees the growth in the ad tech projects mainly because they have to adopt or there are new channels 
uh, there was a lot of investment into the first party space uh, compared to the third party data that it, it used to be for the last decade. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, not, not sure if you, if you want me to elaborate on anything else in, in particular here. Right, so Tarun, uh, there's a specific question for you. Uh, this says, what kind of tools do you offer to the marketers to empower them to use your channel or your shows? So <clears throat> what we're developing now, um, while we have four ad, ad products, which is uh, AdVault, Amplify, uh, and we also have a big DMP called Infonomics, which we allow uh, marketers to set up their campaigns and, and set up their audience segments and so on and so forth. What we now work with ClearCode is to build out an entire self-serve platform, uh, which will allow and empower uh, marketers to be able to do almost everything themselves. Forget uh, setting up audiences and campaigns, but also do uh, biddable advertising, buy biddable advertising, right. uh, and to hold so also to be able to do optimization, waterfall analytics, um, and basically end-to-end -end optimization on their campaign. So our entire vision is that, our, that the advertiser or the advertising agency will be fully empowered in every, in every way to be able to advertise on our platform. And it will have very low managed services or, or human intervention. Right, fantastic. We don't have uh, time left, so I'll ask one last question, which is also very relevant to the Indian market, uh, to both of you gentlemen. Uh, measurement in digital uh, has been uh, kind of a bone of contention for the last many years, unlike the legacy media, which has you know third-party me measurement tools run by companies like Nielsen. In India, you have a bar for TV, you have a MRUC, uh, which does IRS, the readership studies. Uh, digital does not have any third party measurement tools. Do you think the time has come Tarun to have third party independent measurement tools? It will allow the industry to go at, grow at a much faster rate. So digital having said that digital is far more transparent in terms of data as compared to legacy media. But do you think if we have third party measurement at this point of time, it will help us jump the growth curve even faster? So there is, uh, so to let me correct you here, Naval. Uh, there is, no single currency that measures everybody together, but there is measurement of individual platforms, which is third party. Right. Okay. So on our platform, we have Oracle's mode, which uh, measures view through rates. So how much of the advertising did anybody see? We also have Nielsen's DAR, uh, which gives advertisers an ability to see who saw an advertise, who are, saw an advertising, which is what age, what genders, and whatever filters we decide to sell and they decide to measure. So those two parameters already exist on most good quality platforms. Uh, but I think there is a need for all platforms to come together and build a single currency. And I think that um, even you know, at IMAI, I'm trying to work with almost all platforms to see if you know, we can come to a consensus. There is uh, obviously word, uh, that is work that is happening at Bark and Ecamm. There is work uh, that is happening at Nielsen individually. So yes, there are platforms. Uh, there is Conviva, which is also trying to do something on the smart TV side collectively. So there are lots of options and opportunities that, that are coming together. And I can tell you with all my experience in this space, it's not more than 18 to 24 months away. We will find a solution to something like this. Right. And people like Maches are doing a lot of this kind of work through Pivik. So let him tell us a little bit. Ache, why don't you tell us globally how is the third-party independent data measurement uh, being tackled? We know that so, Google, Facebook are not on third-party platforms. They do yeah, that. so I mean there are ecosystems like Google and Facebook does not lo does not let independent measurement. And yeah. There is a lot of controversy and uh, even lawsuits uh, uh, because of that. Uh, what I see is what I want to point out is maybe something different. So. Uh, when it comes to independent measurement on uh, web, for example, when it comes to audiences, this space will get uh, disrupted by the demise of cookies that we, that we covered uh, earlier, as well as by privacy laws, because by tracking these users, you share their information and there needs to be some new mechanism developed. And similarly to OTT, we have to develop some new currency and new systems, uh, how to do it uh, in a privacy friendly way and at the same time so that we can compare apples to apples rather than have uh, like 
right now, like even with some leading platforms, you have significant differences in kinds of uh, measurement. And that has been always the case, like with every time we go into integrating, for example, real-time bidding platforms, we see these discrepancies, we get them down quite a lot, but they are always there. And that's because like different vendors uh, have a, a different, let's say, currency of how, how certain things uh, are being measured. So uh, to sum up, uh, there are still challenges ahead to, to make it uh, independent of the channel, but we'll get there. I, I, I'm sure that we'll get there uh, globally as well. Brilliant. Uh, we, are, we are out of time. And as you know, we are, uh, this is a, a you know, larger MarTech event and we have the next speaker already waiting. So thank you to both of you gentlemen. It's exciting. I'm sure to be in the OTD space. It's a sunrise sector. Uh, while legacy media is looking at many, uh, confronting many, many issues, especially during the lockdown, OTT is a sector which is likely to continue to grow at a very fast pace, but with the challenges of having technology and having more competition. One of the reports I read said India alone has 95 OTT platforms now and growing because, you know, every month one or two new OTT platforms are launching. So with that, thank you to both of you uh, for spending your valuable time. And we'll uh, try and take some of the conversation uh, offline. Thank you, Tarun. Thank you, Mache. Uh, Rohel, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, Thanks. for joining us. Thank you. Great, great listening to you. Thank you. Now we move on to our next uh, uh, special segment, uh, which is an uh, expert talk with Adam uh, Toporek. He is the president, uh, CX advisor, chief client hero, CTS service solution. Um, since we are in different time zones, we recorded this uh, session earlier in the morning today. And up next is uh, Mr. Toporek uh, with his special uh, keynote on uh, customer experience. Can we have it on screen, please? Welcome to Exchange for Media MarTech India Bridge One series. We have with us Mr. Adam Toporek, President, Customer Experience Advisor, Chief Client, Hero CTS Service Solution. Uh, he's gonna talk about uh, how customer experience is changing uh, as we enter a very challenging uh, phase uh, in terms of marketing brands. And before we begin, I want to just talk about that Adam is an internationally recognized customer experience expert, a keynote speaker and customer experience trainer. He's also the author of uh, the very popular customer, Customers That Stick blog and the co-host of the Crack the Customer Code pod podcast. And uh, welcome, Adam, to this, uh, uh, to this uh, session that we have. Uh, I just want to begin with, tell me, um, how are you spending this uh, time? I mean, everybody is talking about pandemic. How is it, how is it this phase for you? So for me, it's, you know, it's interesting because I worked at home before because I was either on a plane doing trainings or speak, doing keynote speeches, or for the most part, I worked out of my house. So uh, I'm pretty used to that part of it. Like that wasn't a big change for me. So I was very fortunate in that way. Uh, for me, you know, I'm reassessing how we approach the business. I'm reassessing how we scale and approach things. And I'm sure we're going to talk about how other companies are reassessing right now. Right. Uh, and, you know, just uh, also working on some personal projects now, taking some time to uh, focus on a few other things. Right. So, I mean, the entire business model has moved online and remote is the next big word that we are, that we are hearing from everyone. Tell me, uh, coming from a world 90 days back, a very different world to a world where remote distance, socially distance, you know, zero touch is the norm. Is it difficult for brands to create experience, the kind of engaging customer experience. Is there a shift? Is there a change? Is there a challenge? A hundred percent. And, uh, you know, one of the things we've seen in the past few months is that organizations that were already in the midst of digital transformation, that were already uh, embracing some of these ideas, they had a head start. They were already further down the road and they're able to pivot better than organizations who didn't have the, those components. And it's super tough. So you just look at something like channel volume, right? So you, t you think, uh, let's do an airline. If we talk about an airline and they've got all these people coming in the airport mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden within a week, almost no one's in the airport and all the representatives they have in the airport that handle all these situations 
all that volume has moved to chat and email and phone. Right. And now they're, how do they shift their resources? How do they scale and take, uh, you know, this volume that was over here and move it over here rapidly to make sure the customers serve. Right. So you've got the channels are shifting. Then you've got the business models shifting. So if you're a restaurant, now, you know, you, you, your entire business was set up or you know, the majority of your business was set up to serve people in the restaurant. And you may be back to that or you may not. But if you're back to it, it's still a smaller part of your business. Now you're doing pickup and curbside and handling, you know, I don't know, five times the orders on the phone that you did before. So, you, so there's this challenge of simply allocating resources and the shift in the model. And then the final, I mean, to me, the big challenge, I know we're going to talk about this of the day, mm-hmm. is that the emotional state, the expectations of the customer have shifted. And right. not only adapting to all these operational and logistical challenges about delivering experience, but adapting to that at the same time is super challenging. Right. You know, there's also, uh, you know, the kind of volume, uh, volume people are handling in terms of, say, you gave an example of airport or the restaurants, you know, readjustment, for example, a quick readjustment uh, is not possible, not from the infrastructure point of view, not from the training point. Uh, point to point of view, you know, it's, it's impossible to be readjusting such a short span. But do you think still businesses have done good, you know, in terms of at least adjusting to it so fast, very agile? Uh, well, we have an expression here that's uh, necessity is the mother of invention. I'm not sure if you heard it, uh, but uh, you know, people uh, start to figure out things really quickly when they have to. That said, yeah, the performance has been all over the map. I think some organizations have done fantastic with it. I think some organizations have struggled. And part of that is, as I said before, some people were further down that road already. Right. Right. Um, so if you take something like Amazon, you know, we think, okay, Amazon, this is the, the ultimate digital, you know, still uh, heart, you know, soft goods business, right? But they, you know, they were already digitally transformed. Their business is digital. Right. But they had to shift to, wait, our volume just tripled. 10 times, wait, are we going to make sure that we send, we can't handle the volume, are we gonna have to start delaying, even these people that pay us for Prime, that pay a bunch of money a year to get their items in two days, are we gonna have to tell those customers, hey, we're not sending sweaters out that fast. It may take two weeks because here's the medical necessities, here are um, you know food and staples and all these medicines, right. things that they prioritize. So, right, so even they had to shift, right? right? Um, and so it's, yeah, I think it's super tough to, it, it's been challenging for some organizations to find that balance. And, but on the other hand, the ones that have pivoted have, uh, the word I like to use is they've accelerated. They're, you know, they took what they were already, the path they were already heading down, but now they're just 5X, right? 10X, they're accelerating how they go down that path. You know, the, as you mentioned earlier also, uh, there is this longing for a human connection, you know. I mean, no matter how much we deliver online and uh, keep them engaged, but this human connect, uh, that factor was, is always missing on the scene. How can that, uh, how can brands kind of offer something which is fulfilling this vacuum of human disconnect that we witness right now? What is your advice to brands, to marketers in this situation? All right. Well, th- well, thank you for that question, because that's something I was talking about before COVID happened. Uh, so I actually came up with a term years ago called signal stripping. And right. what that means is we're wired for each other, just evolutionary biology. We are wired. I would, why I can read facial expressions. We can read tone of voice. We can read a smile versus a frown. Uh, we have all this wiring to sort of know if somebody came out of the forest 10,000 years ago, whether they were a threat or not. Mm-hmm. But we're wired for them. And here's what happens. When we go down the channel chain, these human signals that help us understand, doesn't mean we can't have misunderstandings face-to-face. It happens all the time. But it's a lot less likely than in an email or in a chat because we don't have, I can't tell if you're smiling, you know, or if I forget the emoji. So when we strip away these signals, the emotional connection is more distant. It's harder to maintain. Right. And one of the things organizations have to look at is, okay, how do we, to your question, how do we bridge that gap? So with that set up, there's a few ways we can do that. The one is making sure that we are trying to create an emotional experience. Mm-hmm. 
okay, and a positively emotional resonant experience. So there was actually a study, I, I think you'll like this, Rael. There's actually a study of uh, sorry, uh, customers that have had a positive emotional connect, uh, experience versus a negative one. And the ones that had a positive emotional experience were 15 times more likely to recommend. 15 times. That's NPS. Eight times more likely to trust. Six times more likely to forgive. That's the power of emotional connection. So what the first thing I would advise companies to do is this. Start with the word you said a, a little bit ago, training. Right. They've got to have empathy. We have to understand that if somebody's calling about their mortgage in the middle of COVID, if you're a bank, Right. That that, you know, some of those calls were already scared and negative before. Now, a lot of them are going to be. They're worried about their job, their spouse's job. They're worried about the economy. They're worried about they, you know, they lost their job. And having the team that's on the other end of that phone, when that, they get that call, trained to understand empathy, to understand the person and where they're coming from is one of the best ways to create that emotional connection. Right. I know, Adam, I agree, you know, online is there, but uh, there's, a, there's a limitation of communication. For example, it's a, it's a non-verbal communication where when you're in present, exactly. when you see, read the expressions, you know, the aura around, I think that cannot be repeated online. Or do you think we can reach a tech stage where this can happen? Just want to add, since you know so much about this. Uh, you mean like way in the future, like augmented yeah. reality, yeah. virtual? Yeah, I mean, I think if augmented reality gets really cool, uh, probably it can be pretty i mean it'll get pretty close probably i don't know there's still like a energy when you're with somebody mm -hmm. uh you know that i don't know if that'll be replaced but what we do know is the mind is really good at being fooled <laughs> so if the virtual reality gets really good it'll be good right now this is one of the best ways is what you and i are doing like this would be an entirely different feel if we didn't have the video absolutely right it adds a lot of layers so there's a lot of operational challenges to video bandwidth challenges also whether the customer is set up for video but to the extent that you can add video to replace, um, not replace, but to augment yeah. chat and email and phone, it's powerful, right? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. You know, these brands are facing another challenge, which is that one, they're going through a dip in sales, you know, overall. So they have to deal with that power of it. And at the same time, they have to focus on their customers. So they are torn between two ends at the same time. How to deal, how can brands deal with the situation better and focus on the customer while they have also the business challenge because of low sales and, you know, the growth is, uh, the business is low at the moment. What is your advice to brands in such a situation? So I would say this, uh, you know, it's, they're all one thing. It's, it's easy to separate them, but they're sort of all one thing uh, because, if, if you're dealing with resource, to me, I'm one of the few people that you'll in CX that'll say this, the great majority of customer experience challenges are resource challenges. If I had an unlimited budget and an unlimited staff, do you know how good my customer experience would be? You know, in, in the end, it's a, it's a question of where do you put resources? How do you allocate resources? So one of the things I look at, is if you're in a situation where, uh, you know, your business is shrinking, your industry got hit, uh, my industry got hit, training and keynote speaking. I'm not on stages right now, right? Mm. Uh, one of the things is do what's called an 80-20, right? And that's, uh, I don't know if you know that principle, it's the yeah. idea that, okay, yeah, 20% for, for the listeners, 20% of your inputs create 80% of your results. 20% of your customers create 80% of your sales, 20% of your customers create 80% of your headaches, et cetera, right? Uh, focus on the 20 Figure out the, the, the vital few inputs that really matter the most. Even if that, if you can't staff all your channels, so which ones are the most important? Right. Which hours are the most important? Right. If you have to, which customers are the most important? Right. Which touch points are the most important? When, you, when you're constrained, you've got to maximize the impact of what you can do. Mm -hmm. And approaching it that way, whether it's channels, touch points, uh, staffing, training, budget, whatever it is, trying to figure out where you're going to get the most bang for your investment, for your focus in the experience is the best way to approach when you have limited, more, we always had limited resources, but when you have more limited resources than before, that's my best advice. Perfect, perfect. Um, there's another uh, issue which is happening that uh, in this, uh, we are in well over 90 days into this situation and uh, habits have been formed. You know, there's a certain mindset that is getting set. 
for marketers, for brands, for customers and everybody else. Uh, tell me this phase, which is going to last for some more time as people say till we find the vaccine, what, how would it impact the long term engagement with customers? Would it create its own impression on the way we deal with uh, customers, you know, the brands deal with customers or the customers deal with brands? How do you see that impact being created? Well, I'd say 100% that's true. Now, it is going to differ by industry. Different industries have been affected different ways, right? Uh, for Amazon, it's sort of a short-term challenge, and they've grabbed more market share than they probably planned on. You know, I always joke Amazon's executing their 10-year plan in three years right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just owning more of the, the pie. Uh, but if you are a restaurant, right? you are car rental, if you are hotels, like all these things, um, there's going to be a lot of shifts. And some of those are going to, in some cases, buying patterns have permanently changed, I would say, right? So what, here's an example. Uh, somebody was talking to a, a customer about this. It's a, like a big uh, home improvement store. And they could never really get like um, a curbside pickup as a thing. Like nobody, there's this is never any buy-in for it, right? Now, Huge focus, huge focus, big shift, right? Something that couldn't get off the ground. So you're going to see that internally in organizations. Um, you know, if you look at like a restaurant, all right, let's do that. They're going to go back to uh, full capacity. Maybe not until, you know, one of the biggest restaurateurs in New York, Danny Meyer said he may not open until there's a vaccine because he doesn't know if he can run his businesses mm -hmm. half full. He doesn't know if the margins are going to be there to cover the expenses. And one of the big things, and, and just I'll just keep with the restaurant, is because it's a good example, because it's one that's really changed. Uh, you know, for a lot of restaurants, particularly ones in like nice areas in Manhattan, things, their their profit is at the bar. Like there is like the food keeps it keeps pays the bills, and then the profits at the bar. Well, the bar, what's the bar look like right now? All right. So I think you're going to see a lot of adaptation. Absolutely, there's going to be major changes, but it's going to depend on the industry and it's going to depend on what happens next, right? Do we have a vaccine in three months? Do we have one in a year and a half? Right. What does the vaccine mean? How effective is it? Uh, so it's a lot, of a lot of change, but some of it will be permanent and organizations need to start anticipating and trying to understand what the future looks like in their industry particularly. Right. I'll come to my last question, but I have one quick question. Uh, you know, a lot of brands and uh, marketers are waiting for the vaccine to be, you know, just kind of uh, discovered, you know, uh, a solution to be discovered to this uh, problem. Tell me, um, is that the right strategy to wait for it? Uh, or should you let your business strategy be agile and get into a new kind of, you know, open up and look for some solutions quickly? even though the vaccine is not there, what is the best approach that you think at the moment marketers and brand owners can take? Uh, I would say uh, that's a complicated question. So I uh, will say, number one, I am not a medical doctor. I'm a customer experience expert. So we'll just add that in. Um, and, but you know, with the vaccine, there's, there's not a lot of certainty what that looks like, right? I mean, right now we have flu vaccines, but we never know what strain of flu it is. Right. <laughs> Every year, right? Uh, so we don't know what the vaccine is going to really mean, even when we have one. That said, you know, I mentioned Danny Meyer, what he had, the comment he had made. I think that to me, you should be looking for what you can do. You can't just, you can't just wait on a lightning bolt out of the sky. Right. Now, if you can't think anything, maybe you are waiting, but you shouldn't be waiting because you think that's the way to, you know, I, I'm waiting for things to go back. You should be adapting now because you don't know if it's going to go back. You should be right. figuring out what you can do. A lot of restaurants are doing that, right? They're doing curbside pickup. They don't have in in, uh, in restaurant dining now. They're right. they've pivoted that way. Now they probably aren't at full staff. It's not good. It's not as good, mm -hmm. but they're keeping the doors open and they're they're creating revenue, creating profit. So I to me I don't I believe in taking control of your destiny, whether you're a person or a company, to the extent right. you, you the extent that you can. And I don't think you should just wait around. Right, right, right. Right. You should be looking. If you don't find anything, that's one thing. But at least you looked. You tried. Perfect. Well said. My final question is about, uh, uh, as an expert, uh, customer experience expert, uh, what are the broad trends uh, that you foresee emerging? 
from here on as we move? A few. Uh, number one, the thing we just talked about at the individual level, I think that is one of the biggest ones is uncertainty. We have, you've, organizations have to adapt to the idea that the, there are no three-year plans right now. <laughs> they're, they're gone. They're, they don't exist. There's no such thing. I mean, maybe depending on like your industry, if you're in manufacturing, but big picture for a lot of industries, there is no three-year plan. You're lucky if you have a three-month plan, right? <laughs> so you've got to have a short, I mean, you've got to have a short cycle that's based on flexibility, that's based on, okay, you know, before a lot of organizations said, oh my God, who could have seen this coming? Okay, fair enough. But what about now? Now we know, okay, it may come back. It may do this. It may do this. There's sort of these uh, path, you know, different pathways it could go. Do you have a plan for each of those? Right. Right. So planning for uncertainty, embracing that as part of your strategic planning is huge. Uh, next thing is, and we've been talking about this already, is greater digital integration and transformation. All right. I use the word integration to talk about that, uh, that right. connection between the human and the digital. So it's important to me to talk about it as integrated as opposed to transformed, but it doesn't matter. It's the same thing in the end. And that part of it, figuring out how you're going to transform, how you're going to use digital to make up whatever way that is for your industry and your business model, how you can use that. You know, for example, if you, uh, you know, had online ordering before or something like that, right. Or you had online shopping. Well, now do you have it in a way that integrates with, a, with the new uh, in-store method? Okay. You're using the app to communicate with customers mm -hmm. about uh, yeah. whatever, how, how far distant they have to be, all the cleaning things you're doing, all the safety protocols that they have to wear a mask, whatever it may be in your situation. Right. Are you using the technology to keep up with the times? Right. 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 Uh, and then finally, I think, one of, the, one of the last things I'd say is really trying to understand that the the psyche of your customer has changed. We and we alluded to this earlier. I think I, you know the the customer has changed now. The customer is more scared, more concerned, more uncertain. And if you can be, if you as a company, as an organization, can be a rock for them, can be right. something they can rely on, something they can have faith on, something that they know is there for them. You, know, you talked about that emotional connection. Well, part of that emotional connection is I can rely on you. You're not going to take advantage of me because I lost my job. Right. You're not going to take advantage of me because you have the last supply of Clorox, <laughs> you know, whatever it is that it's, there's a huge opportunity to right now. It's a, it's a, it's bad how we got there, but there's a huge uh, opportunity for organizations to prove how much they care about their customers at this time. Right. Right. Thank you so much. Lovely, great insights. It's been an insightful discussion. And uh, hopefully uh, next time when the world opens up again, and we hope to see you uh, in India talking to us one-on-one, -on -one, I would love to do this session off, offline, you know, someday. Thank you so much for talking to us and uh, to Exchange for Media. I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Well, thank you, Rahel. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Fantastic sessions, uh, both of you. We now move on to the last session for the day. We have with us Rahul Garg, CEO of Moglix, and he will be presenting a success story on entrepreneurship and leadership in the times of COVID. Uh, just to give a little brief about Rahul. Rahul has extensive experience in strategy, product management, and operations in the technology space. Prior to founding Moglix in April 2015, Rahul headed advertising strategy for Google Asia, where he built a $2 billion business from scratch. He started his career with ATM Systems, a Bangalore-based startup where he led the uh, wireless uh, LAN satellite receiver algorithms team and developed a knack for building world-class products. He has also serviced as chairperson of the marketing and ad tech com uh, committee at IAB Singapore. Companies like Cognitive Sim Systems and Freescale Semiconductors also form a significant part of his journey in the technology industry. Rahul is also an investor, having invested in more than seven startup ventures. Uh, he has also made a global presence and holds about 16 US patents in the form of product management and technology, and has contributed to five publications of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, USPTO.
Rahul, we're very happy that you're here today. Over to you. Thank you, Sonakshi. Uh, I think I am not. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, fantastic uh, to be present in the new normal with all of you. My, uh, I would say the marketing fraternity, I refer typically as my fraternity because having spent five years at Google, I pretty much was part of uh, the marketing and advertising re re revolution and going from offline marketing to online as a primary channel of marketing in those days. So very excited to be back and uh, share my experiences in a different context of building a company, building a brand over the last five years. And this is still early days of our journey. So we continue to build a company which is disrupting B2B commerce in India. So let me try to get the screen projection. Okay, so actually just confirming that people will be able to see my slide. Yes, they can. Okay, fantastic. So uh, the topic I was given today was talk about my experiences in building Moglex and then also speak a little bit about how the COVID has impacted broadly the startup ecosystem as well as what Moglex is doing in these times, which are unprecedented and fairly chaotic for all of us globally. So if you look at the step one, which is about starting uh, Moglex, we started with a very simple goal and uh, having worked with many of the consumer commerce companies, consumer brands, you talk about CPG brands being built, you talk about travel e-commerce brands being built in the consumer segment. One of the areas intrigued me was how does this play out when you start to look at uh, business to business transactions happening in a, a country like India, where you can guess from this picture that is being projected, this is the distribution ecosystem of India. This is a picture, live picture from a place called Chandni Chowk uh, in Delhi, the old Delhi, the old part of Delhi, which continues to act as the go-to destination for all wholesale product buying in India. And this acts as the feeder to all the subsequent dealers, retailers in the offline world or to the manufacturing sector of the country pre-Moglex. And I think this was astonishing for me to see that having gone through independence and 50, 60 plus years of those, we are still uh, and uh, in the world where uh, we are getting uh, companies like uh, Flipkart, companies like Ola, companies like Swiggy, delivering fantastic consumer experiences as a consumer using uh, asking for products or for services or food, the businesses continue to buy from this old school distribution world, which does not have an effective storefront or an online storefront, so to say, uh, does not have effective supply chain or ways to get the products from their shop to the manufacturing industry or does not have an efficient financial system to support, how will they uh, work with manufacturing organization and support the working capital needs that are inherent to any B2B transaction. And that is what we set out to disrupt uh, back in 2015. And this is all pre-GST times where India was a federation of multiple states having their own taxation structure which made it even more complex than what we see today. So with this simple goal, how do we take this old school experience into a digital journey? That was a challenge in front of us. How do we make the manufacturing companies, whether they are automotive companies like Hero Honda, companies like Maruti, their ancillaries, or companies like Tata Steel, or companies like Unilever, which have gone through a fair bit of digital journey in their marketing and sales departments. How do they start to think of this in their procurement and supply chain? Also on the supply side, if you look at it, you have to uh, convince them to come online, to start cataloging their products, to start to make 
uh, the entire pricing as a more transparent versus uh, something which happens on a one to one basis as a uh, non transparent uh, pricing mechanism so these are the things you had to change for a company like moglex uh, to be successful and those were behaviors changing on the buyer side on the supplier side also building the entire infrastructure of uh, transportation warehousing because uh, the old school distribution pretty much relied on something like a rickshaw something like a what they call as the chota hathi where uh, you uh, have the tata ace kind of products and sometimes a guy is uh, traveling on bus delivering products i mean all kinds of crazy ways in which the products were getting delivered pre moglex and we said this sounds like a pretty interesting problem interesting large and broken and we will bring technology into this world we will work tirelessly on uh, educating many of these guys uh, just like back in 2010 i was educating many of the advertisers to start taking online advertising seriously i said this is uh, the next opportunity for me to start educating buyers and suppliers into this direction and today where we stand i mean 5 years into it uh, we have more than 500000 plus skus across 45 categories that we supply these are categories ac across safety products across electrical products across bearings many of the industrial categories some of you may or may not be familiar with but this is a very large assortment uh, of products that we deliver today we work with uh, suppliers and customers uh, across uh, multiple brands that you must be familiar with whether it is on the supply side i can think of companies like havels i can think of companies uh, in the uh, like siemens skf all of these uh, companies working with us and on the customer side you name any industry whether it is uh, fmcg company like unilever gsk or companies in electrical domain or companies in pharmaceutical uh, some of the interesting pharmaceutical companies which are also working on covid uh, vaccines and medicines uh, during this time all of these companies are now getting powered by moglex in one way or the other and therefore it becomes a very very interesting journey of taking through for a completely non digital experience to a digital organized experience that we have been building we are present in now 20 plus cities across the country from where we cover pretty much uh, most pin codes across the country which are relevant more than 25000 pin codes we cover uh, on a monthly basis through these locations and with 700 plus people working with 1000 plus manufacturing organizations delivering a consistent experience on a daily basis what has been the disruption due to covid if you look at whatever i talked about so far i mean there are multiple elements to it so the first element of the supply base and uh, many of you would realize that during the lockdown and even in the unlock era that we are today many of the physical markets would literally bang, went offline uh, they were not operating shutters were down and the entire distribution ecosystem was disrupted the second thing that happened was many of the manufacturing plants were shut down or started to operate with a lot of safety precaution and uh, if they were allowed to operate third i mean you had to figure out how do you operate your warehouses when uh, the entire country is in lockdown because you have and this is this is a picture live from one of our warehouses Uh, back in april when we had to figure out how do we maintain social distance and continue to operate our warehouses in an effective manner in last given the space that we are in pretty much in the essential services because we are dealing in safety products some of the medical supplies so on and so forth there is some things we can do work from home but there are some things which would require us to come to office otherwise we would not be effective or efficient and uh, how do you design protocols of working uh, effective both on the work from home and work from office um uh, in an effective manner and uh, i would be proud to say that we have almost uh, every single of our offices today working and even mumbai which is uh, 
which is one of the most uh, sort of impacted areas i mean this week some of our brave uh, people at moglex have started to come on and off to office as well while the warehouse has been working all through and so is the case in delhi and so on and so forth and that is how the india keeps running because if we stop i mean there will be another massive set of supply chain disruptions just like what you see in food and medical if those companies or those supply chains stopped working during lockdown now it meant also the change of products that we were dealing with i mean suddenly from selling a lot of electrical and bearings we were getting into product categories which were becoming more and more prominent and one had to come up with innovations in all of these products so you would find there are hundreds of products that we have worked with during this time and continue to uh, uh, sort of innovate on how do we make them more effective one of those innovations is uh, how do you get a reusable washable mask which is still protective enough and it's not like a cloth stuff that you uh, literally get and which provides you semi protection not the entire protection but how do you design for that and how do you get the materials and how do you get the right manufacturing done those are kind of the innovations that we have been partnering on the in this time we also have had very interesting case studies where one of the largest fmcg company globally 50 billion dollar plus uh, fmcg company they had a unique challenge where they needed many of the uh, personal protection products across the world and they looked up to us and said can you support this supply chain across the world for us and we were able to export from india more than 20 countries so, and today i i am i feel proud to certain extent that we have impacted more than 10 million people directly or indirectly by supporting medical supplies for them uh, globally second i mean vande matram mission we have been integral part of uh, supporting our pilots air hostesses on getting them uh, personal protection equipment in times this is not today when probably it is lot easier to solve for this problem but back in april and may when this was even harder to get uh, some of these uh, reliable products delivered to them we have been part and parcel of making that happen there is also a very important people dimension that happens during this time and many of you would face it uh, how do you keep uh, your organization which is in essential services continue to operate effectively because yes people are suffering from certain amount of fear they have to also step up we have to do the right thing which is spanning across multiple stakeholders whether it is employees customers investors the entire ecosystem of manufacturing companies that you work with how do you continue to be active and making sure that you are taking decisions as a leader uh, covering uh, what needs to be done across multiple of these stakeholders and interacting on a very high frequency with each one of these uh, in a manner which is unprecedented virtually through uh, them across the world also we we have continued to i mean we have always been about how do we disrupt uh, and change the manufacturing and supply chain for the country but this time also introduced a new paradigm for us uh, how do we play a role in uh, one of the greatest challenge the society has faced over the last century and can we be an effective partner uh, whether it is to the governments to the health workers to uh, the people in police people in government and making sure uh, that we are able to supply many of these products uh, and get our supply chain to reach the last level of person who may need some of these products in an effective manner and last i think to summarize i think uh, we continue to believe uh, in a mission where we would change the supply chain and the way the manufacturing ecosystem of the country looks like uh, over the next coming years in a significant manner but this covid scenario has also given us an opportunity to play a role in a broader society objective of how do we come together 
and make sure that the right supply chain is built to get the health products out to the last leg of uh, the country where these would be required the most and uh, doing this we continue to keep all the key stakeholders including every single mogli who is working with us uh, customers suppliers and the broader ecosystem as part of this journey i will pause here i think there is a slot yes. i believe for q and a's so Thank you. Yes. over to you sunakshi yeah Hi, hi, Rahul. This is uh, Rohail here, Sonakshi's co-moderator. So wonderful listening to this session. Uh, there are some questions that I would like to ask you that we have got from the audience. Mm, first question is, uh, what does your Martech uh, Martech stack look like? What does my Martech stack look like? Uh, actually, so it is interesting because I was heading advertising exchange for a while, and uh, also early days of. Uh, uh dbm invite media many of these uh, stack products so uh, so today we are working uh heavily on analytics uh we use i don't know whether it's appropriate to share the brand names but i i think there are two two companies which are strongest in analytics so we work with uh, we have worked with both of them <laughs> and now we have uh, a preference towards one of them uh Uh, so that is one one element of uh, uh, the key product that we uh, continuously uh, focus on uh, we focus on um, a lot of advertising stack products so i'm taking it broader to just not just limiting to marketing but also the advertising stack we use so right. we also uh, broad base and work across the likes of uh, optimization platforms across google and the facebook and social media Tools, whether it is all the way from online reputation management on social media, all the way to performance marketing on a Google kind of platforms, uh, we also uh, effectively have started to go more and more deeper into audience-based and uh, uh, marketing approaches, uh, uh, which are prominent. Uh, more so, I would say in our mobile stack. where uh, it's a big focus uh, mobile app and uh, as all of us know india uh, while consumers were always on mobile app but we start to see businesses moving to mobile app as well quite significant right. over the last one right. year so there are a lot of tools that we are engaged in that direction mm -hmm. and uh, continue to use them effectively right right uh there's another question by sanjay sinha uh how do you market yourself in terms of your brand and acquire new customers so uh we work with typically large manufacturing houses so uh we do uh, follow sales structures as well as um, uh, you would do in enterprise sales organization so a lot of our uh therefore the marketing and go to market is tailored towards enterprise marketing approach um where we would use quite a few classical approaches of uh, email marketing and uh, efficient tools around it we would use inside sales we would use lead generation platforms um uh, combined with an effective enterprise sales uh, strategies uh, that are part of uh, most organizations okay Uh, so in your presentation you made an interesting point about uh, you know empathy in marketing and especially during this time you know what we have seen in the last 90 days i think brands are finding it difficult to sell directly there has to be a factor uh, this empathy has to be the tone of the marketing communication tell me how what is your advice to people to in, in built it in their market uh, stack you know mark tech stack this empathy empathy factor how how can they enable this so i would say uh, and i am a big believer in brand building and uh, uh, articulating what you stand for so i feel marcom is an extension of what you really believe truly as a brand today people can see through it you can't sort of fake it so uh, at least for us what we found is we pretty much fell right in the middle of essential services with the pp and safety right and uh, we said what do we want to do as an organization and uh, which uh, to in today's time is a combination of what we want to do 
for our employees the society and the ecosystem once you decide that i think it becomes far easier because then all you are doing is you are making sure if you want to drive a higher impact that the same message reaches to the right audience so when we are distributing masks to all hospitals on the moglex balance sheet across police and health workers i mean we had to use for example twitter as a marketing approach and we said maybe that's the most efficient channel to get that message out because it's not something that we are really advertising we want to be organic about it because this is something that we believe in and what we should be doing because uh by april 1st one had realized that there were a lot of policemen and uh, doctors who didn't had masks and we were like we will make sure that quite a few of them at least get the first supply of masks uh subsidized by us pretty much given for free and that's what we want to stand for as a brand so i think if you believe and if you have actions backing it you have to use the right media channel uh to amplify the action don't force fit a message if you are not going to follow it through the action because people take it uh, i mean it, it it actually works reverse in these times if you don't take action but you're just sort of playing to empathy for the sake of it Okay, Royal, is there thank another thank question? No, that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, we are. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, keynote. I mean, a lot of learnings from here, and uh, we expect you know uh, to hear more from you as uh, in the coming time as well. So I will uh, request Sonakshi uh, to come and announce. We have the fourth day tomorrow, uh, which has an exciting lineup as well, and she is going to give a brief about uh, tomorrow's session. that we have from 3 to 5 pm where people can join us and what the experts talk about market over to you sanakshi thank you rahul fantastic session highly technical we need to be talk more smarter to understand certain things in this aspect but i'm sure we'll get there one day uh we are ending the session for today and i thank all my audience for being extremely supportive and thank you for being there till the end and i'm sure you enjoyed it as much as we did Tomorrow's session is the last, which is day four of Martech India Bridge series. We concluded with having Scott Brinker as one of our keynotes. So please do stay tuned. He is the godfather of Martech, and we could not end on a better note. So I will see you all tomorrow. Thank you once again, all the speakers for today, and look forward to a fantastic uh, series tomorrow as well. Thank you and good night. Bye. Thank you.